Welcome to Weird Web Radio, an explorer's guide to hidden worlds of the paranormal and occult, reality-expanding experiences, and the downright weird and bizarre, with your host, Lonnie Scott. And now we are recording. Judica Illis, Catherine Skypeck, welcome to Weird Web Radio. It is great to have you here. Thank you so much. It's great to meet you. It's great to be here. Yeah, it likely. It is wonderful to meet the two of you. Um, before we get too far, like I warned you before we hit record, uh, one of my favorite things to start the show off with before we even get into the reason why you're here, hint, hint, wiser tarot deck. Um, <laughs> uh, have either one of you ever experienced a haunting? And who would like to go first? I think Catherine's story is better. So maybe I'll go first. Yeah, no, Catherine's is going to be better. So let me let me go first. We'll save hers for. It's a small. It's a small story of a unimpressive haunting. But when the Wisers moved out of New York City, they bought a big old Victorian on the coast of Maine. And I spent a lot of time there. I lived just down the road. We were very close, kind of like family. One Christmas, um, we were all gathered in the parlor, as Betty Weiser probably would have called it. But they were great collectors of antiques. The Everything was beautiful and intricate and the rugs and the pots and the vases and the windows and the everything. We're sitting there on Christmas Eve, and I noticed a man in a tall, what do you call those hats? Like a chimney sweep? Just kind of walk behind me from that room (laughs) to that room. And I kind of like felt a little crazy. And then I turned to Betty and I said, I think, I think I just saw somebody walk through the room. And she was like, oh, that's so-and-so. Yeah, (laughs) he hangs around here. It's probably just because it's Christmas. But uh, yeah, that was my only experience of really sensing another being in the room with me. And it it was lovely. He seemed to be a nice guy. I like that, especially since it's around Christmas, because so many people forget that Christmas used to be the time to tell ghost stories. Yeah, yeah, still is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it is in my house. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's the season. <laughs> That's right, Judica. How about you? How many hauntings have you experienced? I bet I you're collecting know. them at this point. <laughs> because I've seen ghosts all my life. I have good ghost eyes. I have seen them since I was a child. They don't scare me. What scared me as a child was at some point I realized that I was seeing things that other people weren't. And I found that frightening. Right. But I just, you know, they come and go. Uh, Do you want a ghost story? Uh, Absolutely. You have one? Yeah, I I have an interesting one. Um, So when I was first married, we lived in a brownstone in Hoboken, New Jersey home of Frank Sinatra. And there were three levels. The landlord who was elderly and widowed lived on the first floor. We were on the second floor. And then there was another couple on the third floor. And we were there for, um, so my landlord was elderly. And if we came, you know, you had to warn him if you were going to be late because otherwise he'd lock the door. We were just like living, he, you know, we were just living in his home. Um, and sometimes we would come home late and by late it could be, you know, nine o'clock. And um, he would leave the door open, but all the lights would be off. 
And my husband at that time had very poor vision and could not walk up the winding staircase in the dark. And the light switch was, of course, at the top. But I grew up with depressed parents who had the lights off all the time. So I have really good night vision. So he would wait for me downstairs and I would walk up and turn the lights on and then he would come up. But, or at least that's the story he told me at that time. When you would come into that building, I would see, and and, I, and because I see ghosts a lot, it didn't phase me, but I knew he was afraid. I never mentioned it to him. Sometimes like sitting on the front steps, there would be a woman. She was just sitting there like she was waiting for someone and it wasn't me. And she would just vanish and I, you know, would go home. Uh, so we were there for a while, and then we were invited to a party, a brunch up on the third floor, the neighbors we didn't really know, and, you know, many drinks were had, and at some point during, you know, this brunch, the um, one of the people said, said to us, oh, you're the new people in the building, have you met the ghost yet? Oh, and wow. Before, <laughs> and before I could say anything... <clears throat> My husband speaks up. Yeah, she sits on the stairs, and that's why I'm afraid to go up in the dark. Oh, (laughs) (laughs) but everybody, everybody who lived in—I mean, I don't know about the landlord. I always think she was waiting for him. Um, Everybody saw that same ghost. Everybody had that same experience. So. That's That's wonderful that your husband uh, never let on. (laughs) (laughs) I might have made fun of him then. (laughs) (laughs) That's fantastic. I love it. I mean, both those stories are really good. Thank you so much for sharing those. I see one thing I've noticed over all the years of my life and all the weird things I've gotten into from the paranormal to the occult and everything in between. Everyone seems to have a ghost story. And I just think it's fantastic, especially when I get another, you know, magic minded person on here to talk, tell one, you know, so thank you so much for sharing that. Now let's get a little bit into tarot since that's the, the occasion that we're here for. Um, what is your background with tarot? How did you get into using tarot at all to begin with? Do you want me to go first to this one? You go first, Judica. Um, so I have one sibling who is 12 years older than I am. And when I was, there's a wiser connection here too. When I was starting first grade, we were living in Queens, New York, the beautiful borough of Queens. And I was starting first grade when she was beginning college. And she went to Cooper Union Art Art School, which is very near the old wiser bookshop. And, you know, I had, you know, I would be home, but I don't know whatever, you know, hours before she was, and I would wait for her and wait for her. And she would always, you know, she would go shopping and she came home with all kinds of stuff, you know, albums, music and books. And I was an early reader. And one day she came home with um, a deck of the BOTA cards. That's my first deck. And I saw them and I, like I mugged her. I like, you know, (laughs) and she was very nice because she left me, but Um, You know, she was, you know, larger than I was, but um, I fell in love with them. I just fell in love with them. And I still have that deck. I I just. Was that the deck that you had to color? Yes. Well, she was an art student. What would an art student buy? And to (laughs) me, it was like the most fabulous coloring book I had ever seen. Right. Right. All the Egyptian stuff. It was just gorgeous. I never colored it because I was so intimidated because in the book, it'll tell you exactly which color to use. Right. And I was just, you know, so minor pristine. But, um, and, and it was just love at first sight. And I started playing with them and studying them. And just, it's, it's you know, I still, I'm sitting here surrounded by decks. So I, I still, you know, I, I became a professional reader. I, I you know, I feel very old sometimes, but in 1988, I started reading professionally. Nice. Well, why... 1988. That's about the time I think I found my first tarot deck. <laughs> yeah. My connection with it is also wiser. So when I started 
uh, working for them, I did not necessarily have an esoteric background, but I think I always sort of bent that way. Um, I had been a poet and a painter and the arts were my thing. I think that for a lot of people in the arts, um, uh, intuition, esotericism, the occult comes pretty, I don't want to say naturally, but normally. You don't really blink an eye at it. Anyway, so my introduction to tarot and getting very involved with it was through the publishing company. And um, I'm not a reader, although I would say I'm a I'm pretty good intuitively, but I learned because I think I have edited and or produced in one way or another <laughs> every single book on tarot that the Wisers ever did. And so I just read and read and learned and learned. And um, of course, I was in love with the artwork and it all just made sense. That's an interesting background, too. I mean, to come into it as an artist to work for the publisher. I mean, my goodness, as many books as Wiser has published concerning the tarot, how many have you oh know, left God. on the floor? <laughs> I remember, oh gosh, so many. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. know, I don't know what was left on the floor because, um, I wasn't in those days part of the um, consideration process. Mm. Um, Betty, Betty was really the acquisitions person. She was the the real occultist in the room um, when it came to practical occultism, and uh, so she she had most to do with um, what what was published from new manuscripts. However, having said that, it was Donald and Samuel Weiser who recognized the importance of these books that had been printed in the 1800s and who brought them literally back to life. Mm -hmm. um, so... A lot of my background is very old school, uh, very traditional. Um, no, I'd say in many ways you're 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 kind of an unsung hero in some respects. Like <laughs> oh, if you if you take a moment to definitely. think about it, though, like your contribution to the history of the occult in general, tarot in particular with such a an important publisher like Wiser in this genre can't I mean people should know who you are <laughs> you know in my opinion your your contribution yeah. has been amazing and That's you know sweet. continues to be Catherine does you know all the beautiful covers that Wiser does in one way or another Catherine has you know Catherine's in charge of all of them so that's a lot and it's interesting too that this comes up in a tarot conversation because something that drives me nuts. I'm a professional tarot reader. I have been for many years now. Um, one thing that I, has driven me nuts, and I kind of got this idea from Marcus Katz, you know, working with him, and mm -hmm. that the 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 artist is not celebrated enough yes. when it comes to a tarot deck. Yes. We 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 see the name of the person who wrote the book and thank right you for right. writing the books. But yeah. Yeah, the artist sometimes is it, even the font will be small <laughs> like, and, it, when they're mentioned that somewhere. Actually, was one of the things that was driving us to want to do this yeah. because it was more. I mean, in the end, we were kind of struggling with wanting to put weight on the cover at all. You know, like, eh. but. Um, <laughs> We're we really wanted to here. celebrate Pamela Coleman Smith. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And and the approach to this deck very, very much centered on sort of like what would Pamela do? You yeah. Know? Because and we, we wanted were, to honor her, honor her original vision. Yeah. 
If you go back to her young days at Pratt Institute and look at her as an artist before she got scooped up, um, her work, uh, she worked in watercolor and gouache. Her work was very bold, very bright colors, very flowing, very, um, very much of that time, but just just so unlike what the printing process in 1909 <laughs> was able to accomplish printing a deck of cards. So, you know, everybody, you know, I, it's kind of like Judica and I talked about this all the time, you know, nobody likes their RWS messed with, you know, or they want to burn it down. It's one or the other. <laughs> So, you know, we went into this with a great deal of conversation and sensitivity. But, you know, in 1909, the plates are gone. The printer plates are gone. The original illustrations are gone. Everything's gone. So it's really hard to know what medium she used. It's hard to know what they really looked like, how vibrant they were or weren't. Um, and we kind of gave ourselves permission at that point to almost channel her, you know, to go back to where she was as an artist and try to bring in some of the sensualness of her art, some of the, the love and vibrancy of her as a person. And I think, uh, I think, you know, in the, in the process of, you know, you know, doing this as a work for hire for weight, you know, she really got horribly overlooked. Mm -hmm. And the thing that was fascinating about it, and Judica, please excuse me if I'm just kind of going on too much no, here, but keep going. the thing that was really fascinating about it, so you get weight who wants to do a rectified tarot. He wants to fix the tarot. So he's extremely involved with Pamela while she's painting the major arcana. And he's giving her guidance and keywords and, and symbolism and this and that. But then when it came to the suits, which really had never been illustrated as scenes before, he kind of just let her go. You know, he gave her a, a list of like, well, you know, um, keywords, basically, but no guidance. He at Which, that point, he just stepped out of the picture. And Rachel Pollock sort of has told me, Rachel Pollock and Mary Greer have told me that those keywords that he gave her came from a fortune telling book. Right. You know, they weren't even his. They were just, <laughs> you know, he, he got them. You know, they were perceived as like the playing cards, like playing card divination. Right. And he just gave her fortune telling terms and she created something so magical yep. and so timeless and really has not been given enough credit. Right. Mm -hmm. But it is remarkable as, I mean, you could go to anyone who's doesn't know one tarot deck from another. Right. And I would wager to say many people who are never oh, cracked to open a book on witchcraft or tarot or even even had a tarot reading through media and culture if they were asked to you know identify a tarot card they might be able to their best ability to describe something from the they know the death tarot card. deck they right. know yeah. the death card from the, from the rws right yeah. when i am um, when i do a reading for someone and if i'm using the writer wade smith which i often do and if i'm doing a reading for someone who's not familiar with the tarot I say to them, it's the deck you see on TV. <laughs> and right away they know. <laughs> they know what I'm talking about. We've all yeah. seen, or in movies, you know, the the tarot card killer in the movie Scoop. There's, you know, it's always a right or way. It's the death card or the lovers right. or something like that. It's very recognizable. Yeah. Yeah, very much so. So, I mean, we've got some background now, I guess. How does the Wiser Tarot project? I've got it sitting here next to me. <laughs> how does how does this idea even come about? What what generates the the project to begin with? Can I start with this, Judica? I would like you to start with this. 
Okay, so um, <laughs> I was at Wiser for years and years and years, and then I left and did a bunch of other things. I created my own business. And then in 2016, um, Michael Kerber, who owns Wiser now, he and I actually worked together in another publishing company. And I called him at one point and I, you know, I, for reasons I, I won't get into, I just, I said, I give me a job, you know, give me something to do. <laughs> so um, as early as 2016, I started talking to Michael about, we need to do something for the anniversary of Wiser. Uh, at that point, it was on its 60th year anniversary and for reasons having to do with copyright and everything else, we waited until the 65th anniversary <laughs> of Wiser. But we wanted to do something to commemorate Wiser. And specifically, Donald Wiser and Stuart Kaplan of U.S. Games, who has always done the Rider Waite Tarot, um, because they well, were always, very good friends. Always since Donald Wiser introduced him to it. Exactly. They were very good friends. And Wiser Donald had been on this uh, reissuing reprint track of publishing. So somebody would come into his used bookstore and they would pick something up and be very interested in a copy of it. And it had been long out of print since the 19, early, early 1900s. So Donald was preparing to reissue the pictorial key to the tarot. Uh -huh which hadn't been reprinted in a gabillion years. And said, the, for those who don't know, that's the book by Arthur Waite that discusses these cards. Yes. Right. And he said to his very, very good friend, Stuart Kaplan, who wasn't a book publisher, but was a card publisher. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> why don't you see if you can get the rights to the deck? And he did. So Stuart did the deck, Donald did the book, and, you know, the rest is sort of history. About what time was that? Like, about around what year was that? I would say 72-ish. And, 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 and when they're doing that, how was the Waite Smith, like, underwriter, was it published at any point? Or had it been years since it was available? I think that there were, Judica can talk about the history of the deck, better than I can, but I think it had been kicking around in its various iterations, um, mostly in England. Well, you know, tarot is so prevalent now, and it has so many uses. You know, therapists are using tarot, and they're using tarot to inspire clothing and cosmetics, but 60s 70s it was very obscure yeah it was it was esoteric in the truest sense so i think that there were decks you know i think there were knockoff decks i think there were people who were you know i think its provenance was unclear and of course right. you know stewart would guard that copyright very carefully well, he but, eventually did buy the buy the right from the yes. writer estate, so that but was that was cleaning for clear. that. You, you know what I mean? And you know, writer in some ways, I think, is the unsung hero. Also, yes. you know, Wake got all the credit. Writer, writer names the um, publisher, writer and son, and um, you know they took a chance on a tarot deck, which is you know, it, it wasn't. Now people, you know, may expect to receive fame and fortune but back then maybe you'd get criticism maybe you'd be kicked out of your church maybe you know your <laughs> family would be discriminated against so it was quite a brave thing to do at that time um but and I, I mean believe there... it was one of the first tarot decks that Stuart did yes yes if not the first yes he was a playing but, card company and I think that's what really inspired I think the response to it yeah really you know, this is just, it's its a very pivotal moment in esoteric history. Mm -hmm. This moment where Donald and Stuart come together and decide they are going to take a chance on this project. And here we are now, years later, talking about tarot. And people take it seriously. And, you know, it's a whole, you know, how many decks are there? Who could count? <laughs> <laughs> um, but 
but there might not have been without them. Right. That is true. Yeah. So we we capture a moment in time. Uh, but the I deck is going Pamela, to come alive again. But I think Pamela Coleman Smith, you know, the genius of this, you know, and I, it, you know, it, it's easy to sort of criticize Arthur Wade and God knows I've, I've done it. But I mean, the genius is Pamela Coleman Smith, who created these images that never get old. And right. I've been reading tarot for a long time. That deck is my old reliable. I never get bored with it. You never wear it out. The keywords and, and the interpretations change with time. Yeah. But her images don't. No, yeah. exactly. Exactly. Yeah. All right. So yeah. It was, Carry you know, on. <laughs> Donald had died recently. Stuart, not long thereafter. It was the 65th anniversary of the company. Um, we wanted to do something to honor them. We wanted to do something to celebrate the publishing company and you know judica and i were very invested in celebrating smith yeah so that's that's how it all came about that's how it all came about so one phone call text message did gia just brainstorm and say i know who to put together <laughs> well judica and i have known each other for a long time um, no, I, mean, I, mean, I, started at <laughs> I started at wiser just shortly before Catherine's second her return to wow. us. So, but I, I think you and I know each other from the Witch's Almanac. Oh yeah. We both worked at the Witch's Almanac too. Yeah. yeah. So even if we weren't in the well. same physical space, I yeah. always knew of yeah. you. I knew of your work. Yeah. yeah. Um so I mean it's very uh, cool. I mean as you can hear it's a very compatible working relationship. It sounds that way. Um, so when you're approaching the recreation of the deck, you've, you've got it as it exists today. How do you decide, you know, what card are we going to change? How are we going to manipulate well, the colors? Yeah. Like what was the decision-making process in this? I don't know if change is the right word. I don't know, Catherine. I think we, you we know, it back um, to the bones to Pamela's original vision. I have to say, you know, when when publishers, not just Wiser, but any publisher published a tarot book that they wanted to illustrate, they would always illustrate it with the black and white line art of the cards because that was clearly public domain. So that had been bopping around for a long time. And I was always very, very familiar with the bare bones of the deck. And I would honestly like to say I looked at it and you know when you when you look at the simplest form of what she did it really hits you how little gender identity there is in it how little mm. real specificity of place or race there is in it so one of the things going around in our minds was a kind of well what if we kept that in our minds as we approached this deck? But I got to honestly tell you, most of it was just intuitive. <laughs> and, and, you know, and beauty. Uh, you know, oh, it is beautiful. Because, you know, because the, the Rider Waite Smith deck, Pamela Coleman's art, and I'm a, I, I'm a fan, like I, I've bought her, you know, she has art, non-tarot art circulating also. It's beautiful. Beautiful. And I, we wanted to maintain that beauty. And I, I think we did. And, you know, and there were certain things that we wanted to do. Um, I was very keen on giving each suit um, its elemental identity and mm -hmm. making that a clearer aspect of the cards. So, you know, fire is all themed in one color, earth is all themed in one color, and so on and so forth. Um, that was just important to me to really um, make clear to people that there was this elemental energy that runs through the suits. Um, beyond that, 
honestly, it it really just uh, not so much a channeling thing as just an intuitive process. Mm-hmm. You know, I would check in frequently with Judica, you know, like, am I really screwing something up here if I change <laughs> the sacred color of the robes of the magician? <laughs> you know, and it was like, yeah, not really, you know, so yeah. um that was that was the process. Judica was my anchor and my uh, what would you call it, Judica? My my guiding light. My partner. My, well, we had a good partnership. My my you know my <laughs> training wheels and my handrails, and she kept you know she kept things within the realm of. Uh, I, I mean, there were a few cards that I did, and you came back to me and said, "You know what? You know, um, beautiful the way you've done it, but." Yeah. You know, the star is really this. And, you know, she, she would sort of put me back on track to what the proper energy was that I would I live with that kind deck, of missing. You know? Yeah. And, I, you know, I, we we really also wanted to do it in such a way that and I've heard this from people. We wanted people to be able to look at this deck with really fresh eyes because there are things in there that people yep. have either forgotten to see or they've never seen. They've and, it. you know, we have people telling us, oh, my God, I'm really seeing this detail or that detail. Or, you know, there are these symbols that pass through the entire deck, you know, the crowns and the, the mountains and the towers and things that just flow. And um, it was wonderful to really be able to emphasize that thread however subtly we may have done it um so uh yeah i don't know if there was a question there and i got off topic but well you know i would like to point out though that there is a history we're not the first and i don't know people who are terror scholars know this but there is a history of re-envisioning the Rider Waite Smith. There's the Universal Terror. Uh, Rider Waite Smith. There's the Albano. Um, there is. I don't remember the name of the deck. Do you know? There's that deck where you I've can seen the see, radiant one. The, yes, and all the cards like you see them from behind. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's you know, and so we were we were operating in a tradition. So you know, I I know that sometimes people don't like you to mess with anything, but there is yeah. a tradition of this. And a new way of seeing it, a new way of looking at it. And I think also playing with the the metaphysical meanings of colors. Right. You know, even on a very abstract way. Most of those decks you're talking about that, you know, re-envisioned the Rider Waite using its original art are basically just, you know, making it brighter, making it this, making it that. A little more psychedelic. Yeah. but they're not really changing the palette. They're not really no. going into the deck fresh and approaching it from a different sensibility. And I, and think, I think the watercolors make a big difference too. The watercolors make a big difference. Um, and you know, there, there's stained glass throughout the deck, like images of stained glass. And I think yeah. with, I think with the watercolors, you were able to have some of the power of that sort of, you know, when you're looking yeah. at light through stained glass. We you're really wanted... What card a, has stained glass in it? Like four swords three. would, right? Uh, there are a couple. The five of pentacles, is it? Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, we on, really... keep talking. <laughs> we really wanted to have light show yeah. through the work. Yeah, and you know, it's like, like a wash. Like oh, there's one right there, the five of pentacles. You're right. That does have that. It does seem to just kind of pop out more, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I don't have one of my other Wait Smith decks. The only other one that I've really used over the years. I mean, I think we all sort of cut our teeth with the the U.S. games one that comes in the cardboard box and is available just about everywhere, right? Yeah. The um, yeah. The the little. That's when you get learn. There's a thing called the little white book. Um. 
I'm trying to think. Commemorative. The commemorative deck is the one that I, when I would use the Waysmith deck, that's the one I've used more than any other when I just wanted to get in tune with that whole tradition of it. And you guys are talking about it being a tradition, and I think you're right. It, at times, there's been all these variations that have used Pamela's work as their, I guess, inspiration. And then they've gone everywhere they, you can possibly think to go with it. I mean, there's Pokemon tarot probably out there somewhere right. at this point that looks like a Waitsmith deck. Um, well, it's the, a language. People, you know, there's the Marseille yeah. language, and then there's the writer Waitsmith language. And if you can read one of you know if you can read the writer wade smith you can speak that language and use um here i have uh the halloween tarot here which is <laughs> another one of my favorite right. decks and you know it's it's the writer wade smith just re-envisioned and taken farther but it's the same language and we didn't really want to do a spin-off and go right. away from it as much as we wanted to go into it Right. We wanted yeah. to find that path back. Um, what, you know, it seems sort of grand to say that we under wanted to undertake that, but <laughs> that, that, that's how we felt. I think we yeah. wanted to strip everything back and find Pamela Coleman Smith. Exactly. In the cards too, and really showcase her and highlight her. And right. so, you know, we didn't change because they're still, those are her drawings. Yeah. You know what would be wonderful to find one day would be Pamela Coleman Smith's own journals of oh, her wow. experience dealing with yeah. weight while she's doing this whole deck. Because maybe somewhere in time we'll get such a thing. I don't know, but well, wouldn't that, wouldn't that be great? Famous <laughs> letter that um, I think Kaplan had in his his yeah. biography of her but Stiglitz, there's a right? note that she wrote home i've just finished a very large art project for very little money uh -huh. <laughs> i think it was like 100 pounds or something but um and it was kind of like oh well you know on to the next thing and if yeah. you, I, he, he when he speak when wait speaks of her you know he's a little patronizing towards oh, God. Her. yeah you know, a little condescending uh you know and of course they were both members of the golden dawn and you know, Pamela Coleman Smith had a career. She was she was not just some. I think she's often just somebody Arthur Waite found who would, you know, put his vision into you know and manifest it. But she was, uh, you know, she was a set designer. She worked with, um, you know, Bram Stoker, and she was friends with William Butler Yeats and his brother. And she was not a trivial person. She was someone who who was successful in her own right aside from these cards. And so, you know, we did want to honor her and we did want to showcase her, you know, not to not to push anybody else to the side, but you know, weight has certainly sort of taken up all the oxygen in the room. Right. Until recently. Right. That is true. Yeah, there has been more effort, I think, in the last five, ten years that I've noticed anyway, to bring Pamela yeah. forward and she shine a, a light on her legacy. Teller. You know, she did uh, she worked with Ellen Terry. She was you know, she was a person who um of some status and who was accomplishing things. So she's not just his, you know, paid assistant <laughs> yeah and, and what an icon i mean mm -hmm. did i don't think she did but did pamela ever create another tarot deck or work on another yeah. tarot project in her Not lifetime as far as I know. or make any further commentary anywhere she, she went on to do her um that little broadside the pamphlet um yeah the green sheaf right the green sheaf yeah and it was sort of a collection of art and poetry and um, sort of like a little chat book publication. And I don't know if it was serialized or how many she produced, but that was her project um, after the Tarot. 
did she have any children or anyone no. like that? No. She has oh. me. I'm her child. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how many hundreds and thousands and even into the millions of tarot readers out there who, I mean, if someone could just go back in time and, and say, do you have any idea how important you are to yeah. the future of this world? <laughs> yeah. You know, she died in such poverty. She I has know. an unmarked grave. Yeah. So I think, I think, uh, I'd like to think that she's looking down on us and feeling, you know, very fulfilled and happy at, you know, the appreciation her work has received. She did not receive that during her lifetime. Yeah. I mean, an important part of my practice is honoring ancestors and yeah. that includes those who were, you know, gave us the traditions and the, and the right. things of our, that we value and honor today. I mean, what would it have been like in 1909 for the general public to know that you were drawing tarot deck? You couldn't just go talk about that at work, but I can walk around work right now in a corporate headquarters of a place where I work and, and tell people I'm a tarot reader. You know? yeah. <laughs> what vastly different world right. that she lived yeah. in. And uh, she's, she's an important part of my ancestral practice. Like I, I'm one of, I hope many people who take time out of their offering practices and, and yeah. contemplate her, her, her contribution to my own I life, so. whether she knew it or not. Well, you know, I, you know, over the years, I've been to various metaphysical stores and to events and conferences, and I do see her image on altars and given credit in other ways. So I, th I think that there's a lot of love being expressed for her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you, I mean, if you're thinking over the deck, do either of you have like a favorite card or two that stick out to you? Is there like, it's a reader. I know I have, when I get a new deck, there's always a few cards that I want to see before I decide I'm yeah, buying it. <laughs> well, I mean, the moon for me, it's always the moon. If yeah. I, I'm yeah. two of swords. Oh, yeah. oh, that's, that's the first one I look for is the two of swords. Yeah. It, there's something I mean, about the crossroads to it that I just love. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I was, I was very drawn to particular cards um, and I was very befuddled by others. I remember doing the seven of cups over and over and over. Yeah, but it came out so beautifully. But it was very difficult for me to mm -hmm. enter that card for whatever reason. Hmm. Whereas the swords, you know, woo a <laughs> baby that's just <laughs> me in that element i don't know but uh yeah I I had... yeah there yeah. yeah and certain well, those are amazing are... cards amazing images there no you you've done wonderful and one of the uh, other things that gets commented on quite a bit now and the first thing that i noticed that was different with the wiser tarot is it's it, it approaches one of the problems in tarot as I see it today. There's just a severe lack of diversity in cards. And I mean, I see it with my own reading clients. You know, I'm not just reading for a bunch of white faces, but sure. that's often in a lot of tarot decks is what is staring back at them. And, and I think with this breathing new life in this project and trying to see what maybe Pamela would do now or even what her original intention was. Um, the, that revisioning has been well received with my own clients, and I'm sure it's being oh, well received I'm among so readers. Happy to hear that. That's wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, people it's, people like to see themselves reflected in art. You know, and it's interesting. I mean, there's a whole the radical tarot fringe. You know, would say we didn't go far enough. You know, you know there are no <laughs> fat people. There are no disabled people. There, yeah. But, you know, this is a, this is her art, and we could we could imagine certain projections out. We could we could see the the non gendered aspect of it. We could see the possibility of you know different. Well, that was there. We didn't get that there because it was there. already there. Yeah, but you yeah. know, there was no way we were going to like 
re reconstruct where she was coming from. We really just wanted to see what we could pull out both in both visually and in meaning. Well, we did not, we did not redo any of the drawings. No, we played with color. Yeah. But we did not, you know, we added, we added, astro, we added the, the Hebrew letters. We added, you know, there were little touches, but we did not redraw anything. We, we did not want to touch Pamela's art. Yeah. Yeah, and it shows anyone who's familiar with the deck. I mean, you're not going to see if you haven't gone out and gotten this shit. You're not going to encounter, you know, a complete redrawn. Well, that would be a different new project. version, right? right. Yeah. 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 And I, I also wanted to, in a way, honor the medium, and I very specifically left a lot of the edges messy. You know, there's a lot of yeah. watercolor bleeding out you know, of the, of the box, you know, it, <laughs> I, I didn't want to hem the energy in. So, um, yeah. Well, five stars from this guy. I, Thank I'm you. absolutely well, that, love it. I think it's wonderful. A, Thank we you. know it was made with a lot of love and I hope mm -hmm. that comes through and that people feel that love love for the cards, love for tarot, love for Pamela Coleman Smith, love, love for the people who will use this deck. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yeah. that was our and purpose. I, I, I do feel that this is, this is going to be, I mean, for people who are more interested in connecting with Pamela Coleman Smith in her creative drive to give us tarot, for whatever reason she got started, it's clear Mm -hmm. that it had to have shifted before it ended i mean i didn't even know that part about the fortune telling book concerning the miners like that's that's new on me and it, it just it makes me that much happier to have another expression of her art in my hands and i with each time i use it it, it just feels like you're closer to her and i dig well, that i'll just say yeah. one last cool thing about her Be before this deck, the suits were not illustrated with scenes. She did that. And in that act, you really do see her background as a set designer. She understood the composition of a scene. And that's the other thing that really comes through in these cards. She's, she's putting on the play. She's, she's bringing this to life. Literally, because she's she's looking at it as as a set and she's populating the set and there is action on the set. And um, for me, that's a, a very a important piece of her, uh, regardless of the painting style or whatever. But that's an important piece of her vision that uh, will live on forever. Yeah, maybe one day we'll see the Pamela Coleman, or Pamela Coleman Smith School of Intuitive Art open up and get Wouldn't a bunch of psychic great? kids in there making really cool well, stuff. She, <laughs> she was. I mean, she had like sun, was, she had synesthesia. She synesthesia. Yeah. And actually, I have the same synesthesia. And I haven't well, been talking about this. But that, you know, when I say sort of following that sort of intuitive path down the cards, I got it. I, I mean, I got where she was. So anyway, yeah, for folks yeah. who may not know what that is, could you explain what synesthesia is and how you experience it? Well, you know, like Judica talking about seeing ghosts as a child <laughs> and thinking everybody did, you know, yeah. synesthesia is one of those things that you don't really know you have it until somebody like tells you you do. Um, <laughs> it's you, your senses cross over, you know, you you hear color, you taste words, you know, um, in Pamela, and it could be very different for different people, but in her case, um, she listened to music while mm -hmm. she was painting and she heard the music as color. So that made sense to me looking at not this deck but looking at her body of artwork you can see music in the flow of the paint you can see music in the in the brush strokes well, you can some see people music. can see 
it's just um, <laughs> yeah. So that 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 made a lot of sense uh, to me when I learned that about her. No, I like that. I'm, uh, in so many ways, the more I'm listening to you both tell your story and your involvement in the art, I keep thinking, of course, it's you two that does this, right? <laughs> Who else could it be that was going to bring this out to the I world? I wouldn't have done this with anybody but Judica. I wouldn't well, have trusted I anyone else to hold my hand, and that's true. Oh, but likewise, I, I can't, this project would not exist without you. Yeah, I mean, if 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 a publisher had come up with this idea and said, "Oh, well, let's pick this artist and let's pick this per let's pick this expert," you know, let's put them together, and it was more that Judica and I came up with this together. But it was percolating for a while. It, it was wasn't percolating something, for a while. Like, we didn't come in on a Monday and say we're doing it, and then we did it. <laughs> we 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 had been talking about it for a while. Yeah, we would stop. We'd pick it up again. Um, so it, but it wasn't it like, a, I, you know, it wasn't like either one of us was thinking about talking to somebody else. You know, it's like no. <laughs> me, it yeah. was Judica. So. Oh, yeah. But I mean, the Catherine's involvement goes without saying. I don't think this could have been done without you. It was fun. It was. It was fun. <laughs> we take another uh, yeah. one? <laughs> I sure hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, I mean. Is there another project you two are working on? What's next? I mean, we work on the books. You know, Weiser's a little publishing house. Mm -hmm. So people wear many hats and we're all like in the trenches together. Yeah. I know when I say that Catherine works on every book cover, she works on every book cover. And so, you know, we work together on a daily basis. It's not like a big corporation with all these employees where it's cold and you know you may work with different people we're like a family you know yeah. donald donald and betty and samuel are no longer here but it's still a family it's just a family by choice maybe now yeah i like that it, it's easy to forget that too because you know, if you're someone who's just out there shopping for books you've been buying these for years you're used to seeing that onk on the spine and it, it, oh, no. Oddly, when I was coming up in the early '90s, learning, get mm -hmm. really getting into the occult and everything, with all due respect to Llewellyn, who's become a very amazing publisher in in the last yeah. several years, that didn't feel so true back in the day. And I was always looking for those wiser books to to feel like I was getting something that had more oomph behind well, it. You know, you know? I, I, I'm old enough to remember record collecting. And so it's like, do you remember, I, I, you know, I mean, Catherine, maybe you remember, you know, he'd buy the Atlantic, you know, I'd be looking for Atlantic records or, oh, it's exactly. on the Motown label. I, I'm going to like it because it's on this label. And I think yeah. that, you know, I think metaphysical publishers are a little bit like that, too. Yeah, it certainly was. And now I'm I wouldn't so much make those distinctions. I think I don't know what happened, but in the last 15 years. Something changed in the way, particularly Llewellyn and and why it's, it, like publishers have approached what they're going to publish and give to the world, and how brave it's they're going to be a, allowing what will be said. You know, it's there's a real it, it doesn't feel like they're scared of the public anymore. I think a lot of that has to do with the with young people coming up with this particular millennial generation. It, there has been a true revival of um, deep esoteric thought mm -hmm. in in a in kind of in kind of an exciting way. You know, I I don't know that any of these you know it's really brave to publish metaphysical books, speaking for Weiser mm -hmm. or for any kind of you know. Right. Um, one of my books, I I don't actually think it's a wiser book um i point out that you know in years past to read this book to write this book to publish the book to sell the book to purchase the book that it, it was all potentially against the law depending mm -hmm. where you were but it's yeah. not anymore and i think one of the things you know there is support from the marketplace and support from readers in a way that Maybe there wasn't in decades past. It's mm -hmm. a greater readership. And I mean, I mean, it's crazy where you find 
metaphysical books sold. Like, you know, I know. <laughs> they're all over. You know, you could order from walmart.com. Isn't that um, crazy? Which you could not have done 20 years ago. No. <laughs> so I, I think, I, I think that that is, you know, there's just, there's more, more people, people who maybe had thoughts in their head, but wouldn't write them down or right. wouldn't make it public are sending us proposals. There are more places to sell them more places to review them. I think the publishers themselves, I think, have always been very brave. Everybody else has caught up with us. Yeah. And I think I, I'm glad you made that point. Is I mean, when I'm talking about like the early 90s, okay, yeah. I'm in, in 1990, I turned 13 years old. <laughs> so this is when I'm really hitting my lane and, and figuring out who I'm going to be and testing the waters and it's at the same time you have the the remnants, especially where I live, of the satanic panic. Oh and, God, yeah. And I mean, and I and I think some of that had to be impacting yeah. what was really being published. Now, granted, I'm glad you pointed that out because I don't think it's fair. And when sold. I say, yeah, they're they're still publishing yeah. and selling, but I remember well, there being this real concerted effort to say things yeah. like witchcraft. We're safe. We're fine. Or give us a hug, you know. Come to New York. Come to New York. Yeah. I was just about to say, particularly in the Midwest. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm from New York City, and we were not saying that. I'm from Rosemary yeah. baby territory. Yeah, we're and, not going to eat your babies. We make brownies, well, you know. In New York City, we're not. We're not. We're not telling you that. But um, yeah. the thing is, it's what's available, because yeah. of course there also wasn't there wasn't that internet to just buy books i mean when i was shopping at wiser books as a teenager or at the magical child there were very few oh, stores. i remember the magical child wow oh, yeah. Yeah. there are very few stores that were exclusively metaphysical stores i mean and they were in big cities i mean it, because in new york city you could you could i mean the city was overrun with porn store stores you know why not a <laughs> metaphysical store so um you know it's a very different experience but it was it, i don't think there wasn't a readership for it that would support publishing as many books and also where would you find these books unless you right. lived near a metaphysical store mm -hmm. you couldn't just go online and order them and it would come in a box and your parents wouldn't know you know so <laughs> yeah. There, and, there's a lot more discretion now. And that's the interesting full circle back to Donald Weiser. <laughs> yeah. You know, with his little used bookstore on the east side, well before he was on Broadway. Book Row, but, right? Fourth Avenue. Yeah. And, you know, they were selling old, rare, used books. And mm -hmm. people came in interested in oh do you have another one of those do you have more like that do you have so it was a small group of people or community that that started to recognize what donald had and he started to recognize that this is this was material people wanted there was a desire there was a desire for it and um you know slowly at first just you know reprinting you know Crowley and Mathers and whomever, you know, but eventually the more he reprinted and became known as the publisher to go to for this type of material, the more we started getting in uh, original manuscripts from yeah. all over the world. Because all of a sudden you saw there was a publisher who, who would let willing. you talk. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, you know what I'm hearing is there's a book that I want really bad now, and I don't think it exists. My brain calls it the pictorial history of wiser books. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's what we'll do for the 75th anniversary. Right, 75th. I mean, if I'm still yeah. around by then, yeah. <laughs> All I ask is one little gratitude in the book somewhere. <laughs> This this idea came from. That's right. Wouldn't exist without. It. 
All right. I think this is a good place to come to an end of the regular portion of the show. Is there something that I didn't bring up that perhaps you'd like to talk about upcoming projects, classes, promotions, anything? Um, for the tarot lovers out there. And I imagine if you've been listening to us, you know, keep speaking, <laughs> you, you must love tarot. We've got some amazing yeah. tarot themed books being published and in the near future. And so, um, and we are we are stepping into brave territory with with some of them. Um, yeah, we're working with a a young woman who is um, writing a book on racial healing with the tarot. The tarot. Uh, and also, you know, and and you know, also classics. I mean, we have Rachel yeah. Pollock's next book coming out. Uh, oh, and we're reissuing her Shining Tribe. Yeah. Okay. That, yeah, we've got some. We've got some amazing tarot material so you, i think you should go to the wiser website and i do know, too <laughs> and just making a tiny departure from the wiser imprint over to another one of our imprints which is hampton roads we are coming out with a really wonderful little book on krampus and i'm oh, i'm mentioning fun. that because you had made a point of talking about your uh darkest christmas night of stories. the year right christmas, <laughs> yeah. christmas, not so much yeah. in this time but yeah that'll be fun to do yeah yeah that sounds fun. great stuff let's go over to the wiser website and just like plug tarot into the search engine and see yes. everything that comes up yeah you're gonna buy these tarot decks you gotta learn how to read them yeah <laughs> you can buy the books which, which that's will teach right you how to read them. yeah i mean that's do, right do that and just let gia know i mean if you're not already she should be sending you stuff as it comes out so oh yeah G gia is far too kind to me in this platform Gia's i adore listeners. gia and all that gia student. does yeah Gia's <laughs> Mark, Gia is the wiser books marketing manager and I, I i'd like to think she's listening right now so we're giving you a shout yeah. out to you i'm pretty sure she's gonna listen and and gia if you are listening someday we've got to skate together that's all i'm saying <laughs> 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 all right thank you so much to both of you for being here I, I know we talked about different projects for the publishers, but is there anywhere that people can find you individually that you'd like to shout out? Oh, uh, uh, me. Um, yeah. I mean, my website is kind of down and uh, one of these, I days noticed that. Like, oh God. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm busy working. Um, but I'm, uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm on Twitter for as long as Twitter. I'm, I'm writing this, this, I'm writing this train to see where it goes and I'm on Facebook yeah. and I'm on Instagram. So I'm not hard to find. And I'm just okay. the opposite. I don't, <laughs> I don't do social media. I live on the edge of the woods. Um, I'm a pretty, I'm a pretty quiet person. I have a book right up there. I think it's Wiser, the Witch at the edge, Forest Edge. Yeah, I added that yeah. book. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great book. I didn't know that was about you. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All so, right. Well. Thank you again so much for being here. This has been wonderful getting to know the both of you. Thank you so um, much. For everyone out there listening, we are going to take the rest of this conversation to the Patreon portion. If you'd like to hear the rest of it, go to weirdwebradio.com, click join the membership, or go to patreon.com slash weirdwebradio, and stay weird out there, my friends. Okay, now it is bonus audio time. Judica and Catherine, are you ready? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay <laughs> all right first question is always the same around this place it is what famous person's resting place would you most like to visit um that's tough a very strange answer on my part do you want to hear how they just answered that question what famous person's resting place would you most like to visit that and many others, including what they think about the afterlife, what they may or may not do in cemeteries, what are their traditions, magical practices that have to do with the dead, folklore that surrounds their homes, and so much more, available for only $5. $5 a month. Even if I make more than one episode in a month, it's still just $5 a month at patreon.com slash weirdwebradio or go to weirdwebradio.com and click join the membership you can find me on instagram at weirdwebradio 
You can find me on Facebook as Weird Web Radio or come join the new, fun, and exciting Weird Web Radio Facebook group. Thank you again for being here. Stay weird out there, my friends. Thank you.